In the last lecture, you will remember, I used the expression, sentimentalism is a heresy. And after the lecture, I felt a little uncomfortable with that statement because sentiment is a good thing. And sentimentalism, as cultivating the sentiments, is not a term of reproach and probably ought never to be used that way. I was using it in a way that was, of course, adversely reflecting on it because I was referring to people who, because of sentiment, wrong sentiment, were feeling justified in violating the commandments of God. Now that does happen, but I think I was wrong in using the term sentimentalism is a heresy. No, sentimentalism is a proper thing, a due regard for one's feelings and so on, but probably the term that ought to be used there, though I don't think you'll find it in any dictionary, is sentimentalitis. Itis usually refers to inflammation. Now here's a sentiment which has gotten sick. Uh, once a sentiment gets sick and actually overcomes the clear and infallible teaching of the Word of God, it is a heresy. But let me modify my or former statement from sentimentalism is a heresy to what I meant by it, namely sentimentalitis is a heresy. That is any elevating of your feelings above the teaching of the Word of God means that your feelings have gone to an extreme. They are infected. They're diseased. They're not a wholesome thing. They are a heresy. But true and proper sentiment, which of course elevates God's Word above anyone's feelings and so on, is a wholesome thing to be cultivated. So forgive me, please, for careless use of language. Number nine, as we finish this previous lecture, Though baptism is merely an external rite which does not bring regeneration or prove its presence, may not, being a divine institution, be disregarded or discontinued. I'm referring especially to sentiment which uh, exists among some Quakers, but there are other people who are not associated with any particular denomination who fall into this kind of trap, a feeling we've grown beyond this. We understand the meaning of the right, therefore we need not any longer use the external form. You can see there's a sort of feasibility in this. We do realize that all the Old Testament ceremonies which were point, pointing toward Jesus Christ have no right for continuance once he comes. The sacrifice of animals, which were ultimately referring to the sacrifice of the Lamb of God, have no justified continuation after the Lamb of God was delivered up for our offenses. You could see how someone might say the same thing about the New Testament sacraments, such as baptism, once we understand what its meaning is, namely a cleansing of the conscience, a washing away of the guilt of sin, we no longer need the external sacrament, and the same way with the Lord's Supper. But since God has given us no basis for abrogating these New Testament sacraments as he did the Old Testament form of them, we dare not do it. And furthermore, these which were merely pointing in the direction of the coming of Christ are now established by Christ, obviously meant to be the form in which his worship is continued to the end of the age. Number 10, baptism, which is a divine institution, is not to be confused with dedication, which is merely an ecclesiastical practice in some churches. Whether it's valid or not, you'll have to judge for yourself. But that it's mandatory, of course, couldn't possibly be, since it is not given by a divine command or possesses the characteristic of a divine institution. Baptists who frequently practice this because they do not accept infant baptism, and they do want in some visible way to display to the church and the world that they regard their children as truly as pedo Baptists do as the gift of God, and they want him or her to be delivered to the service and worship of God 
And so they choose to do that by a rite of dedication. Or churches which do have infant baptism may have an additional service. I'm not saying that is wrong. I'm just simply saying it ought not to be confused with baptism. Baptism is from the top down, from God to man in his church. Dedication is from the bottom up. It's moving from the heart of dedicated Christian people to God. God had never commanded a right for that. He does command that attitude, and it's commendable in that regard. But one thing is certain, and that's what I'm stressing here, it must not be confused with baptism. Now we come to lecture 87, infant baptism number one. One, we have seen that the covenant of grace somehow included the infants of the believers in it. That's the first time we really uh, had to do with this, which we're discussing more fully now, when we discuss the covenant of grace. Now here again, uh, Reformed Baptists believe in the covenant of grace, but they don't see it as including the children, whereas the pedo-baptists usually do. And I'm referring to that viewpoint now when we've seen that the covenant of grace somehow includes the infants of the believers. I needn't say anything more here because that's going to be looked at more closely before we finish this discussion of infant baptism. Number two, the original sign of infant incorporation in the covenant of grace made with Abraham was their circumcision at eight days. Genesis 17, 17 to 27. At your own leisure, you must take the time to read this passage. It's fundamental. It's basic. The whole concept of a covenant, not only in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament as well. I won't take time to read those 10 verses now, but you would do well at your earliest opportunity to read them again in the light of the discussion you are hearing now. Three. One of the verses I want to quote here, I will be your God and the God of your seed after you. God had said to Abraham as he gave this sign of circumcision for the seed. That's Genesis 17, 18. I will be your God and the God of your seed after you. God had said to Abraham as he gave the sign of circumcision. That is the most important verse in this whole important uh, passage. And we read it for a third time just so you get the impact of it because it's been the center of the discussion, not only with the Baptists, but within the Reformed community of pedo-Baptists as well, down through the ages to this very day. I will be your God and the God of your seed after you, your offspring, your children. God had said to Abraham as he gave this sign of circumcision for the seed. So on the surface of it, when that circumcision was administered to those infants at eight days of age, God was saying, I will be their God, Abraham, as well as your God. Now that is strong language. If you bear that in mind, you'll see why you hear about some very, very strong interpretations of it. Number four, this infant circumcision was the sign the Lord gave that the infant was in some special sense his. Even that seems like a rather lame comment. You can I see how some strong interpreters of this passage would say, Gerstner, you're holding back. That's not enough to do even superficial judgment on this particular text. When you say this infant circumcision was a sign the Lord gave that the infant was in some special sense his. Gerstner, read it again. All right, I'll read it again in answer to my invisible critic at this point. I will be your God and the God of your seed after you. I will be the God of your seed. Now, he's already indicated the way he's the God of Abraham. You, Gerster, will not deny, will you, that he was the Lord and Savior of Abraham. And when he says that I will be the God of your seed after you, doesn't that carry the implication he'll be the God of your children just as he's your God, name you your God and Savior? 
I don't think it does mean that. But I admit that uh, it looks as if I'm flying in the face of Scripture. And I'll also admit to my imaginary critic, who's not very imaginary, I might say, right now, he's not here, but I could tell you about a hundred people who'd be very glad to be here and say exactly what I have just said in criticism of me and so on, but I'm letting them re be represented by me and trying to do justice to their feeling and let you feel also, whether you agree with them or agree with me on the matter, that it looks very much at the moment as if I was shrinking back from the whole counsel of God. I was unwilling to accept this statement. I was actually a sentimentalist. I was turning it down because of my feeling. I was suffering from the very sentimentalitis which I condemn. I admit it appears that way, and I admit that it's incumbent on me or any who share my viewpoint if we're going to persist in this view that it is not the way it sounds and seems at first glance and so on. The burden of proof, the onus probandi, is on us. I admit that. And until I can show it, I have no right to seemingly tone down this strong word of God in Genesis 17, 18. Number five, Christ replaced circumcision with baptism in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as the sign of righteousness by faith. Matthew 28, 19, Romans 4, 11, Colossians 2, 11. Let me read it again. Christ replaced circumcision with baptism in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as a sign of righteousness by faith. That, I think, is clearly indicated by these passages, and it's an extremely important point that we're going to be examining I haven't forgotten that matter precipitated by item number four. It's a part of the discussion as we move right on through, and I haven't forgotten that I have the burden of proof of showing that that language can't be taken quite as heavily as it sounds at first hearing. But I'm observing what's the center of the controversy here when we just mentioned in number five that circumcision has been replaced by baptism and is obviously meant to serve the same function as circumcision did. I think that's easy to say and it's easy for Pedo Baptist to accept, but at the same time you can sense how a Baptist would have trouble at this point because circumcision was clearly administered to infants. And if its counterpart is baptism, you could see on the surface of it the implication would be baptism must be administered to infants, which, of course, Baptists think is wrong. So at this particular point, they are in a seemingly embarrassing position of equivocating with respect to the Word of God, and will have somehow or other to say that baptism isn't the counterpart of circumcision. Baptism isn't the New Testament form of the Old Testament form of circumcision, or at least they'd have to get around it. The burden of proof here is on the Baptist. The burden of proof at this other point is on those who would say something less than the fact that all baptized children, just as all circumcised infants, have God as their God and Savior. That's the way that language sounds, and this other language sounds very much as if what we in this case believe to be the case, baptism is the counterpart of circumcision and therefore ought to be, the Baptist notwithstanding, administered to infants long before they could be baptized on the basis of believer's baptism. Number six, from that day, to this, <clears throat> almost all Christian churches have baptized the infants of baptized believers. From that day to this, almost all. I keep saying, remember, the Baptists are a minority report. They're very strong, they're very vigorous, and in the United States of America, the Southern Baptist is the largest 
conservative denomination in the country, but looking at it in the history of the church generally, I can correctly say what I have in item number six, from that day to this, almost all Christian churches have baptized the infants of baptized believers or circumcised in the Old Testament, the infants of circumcised believers such as Abraham was. That's all because it seems so evident that circumcision has its counterpart in baptism, and since circumcision was applied to infants, baptism must also be. This doesn't prove that it's right. I'm just observing a historical phenomenon. From the time the Great Commission was given until this day, most of the Christian churches have baptized their infants, and undoubtedly the reason for that is that baptism is the counterpart of the Old Testament circumcision, which indubitably was applied to infants eight years of age. Number seven, especially in modern centuries, there has been a strong rejection of infant baptism on the contention that baptism should be restricted to professed believers. That's the Baptistic viewpoint. You all know it, and I've developed it a little bit previously. I'm just observing it now. It's a minority report. But at the same time, it is a particularly vigorous minority report in modern times. But it is still a very minimal major minority report at that, looked at in the history of the church in general. But it is more vocal, powerful, at the present time than it ever was before, and it is still only a minority viewpoint. Eight, there are two pillars on which the common practice of infant baptism rests. One, the identity of circumcision and baptism, and two, the identity of the church in the Old and the New Testament. Now read that again because I'm going to develop it much more fully. It's the heart of this whole question about the role of infants in the church and what they're entitled to. There are two pillars on which this common practice of infant baptism rests. One, the identity of circumcision and baptism, and two, the identity of the church in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Number nine, these two pillars have been mightily attacked by Baptistic churches. Ten, let us see if the two pillars are still standing. Now let me make clear in this particular lecture just the fact that they are absolutely crucial, that there wouldn't be a practice of infant baptism, probably wouldn't be any at all, and it certainly would not be the almost universal practice of the Christian church if it weren't for these two. Now, in the next lecture, we're going to look at this heavy onslaught by our Baptist brethren against infant baptism, which is necessarily, if what I'm saying now is true, going to be an attack on these two pillars. I think the Baptists realize, and I don't have to say to them, that you've got to knock down these two pillars if you are going to disprove our practice of infant baptism and provide the way for your maintenance of exclusive believers' baptism. See, right now it's almost uh, as if I'm the moderator of a debate and I'm explaining to the audience here what the issue is and what so-and-so is going to defend and what so-and-so is going to attack and how essential it is that this man must be successful in his defense or this man successful in his attack to win this particular debate. Those who rest infant baptism, this overwhelming majority which rests infant baptism, do so on these two pillars. And they, if they can't maintain these two pillars against the onslaught of this enemy of that position and so on, their case is in ruins. And this man wouldn't have to do anything more than say the only other option is his. And by the same token, I think he would agree with me as the moderator of this debate that unless he can knock down those two pillars, he can't possibly establish his own viewpoint. 
In this particular juncture, I'm just trying to get all of you to understand the terms of the debate, the issues in the debate. You all know that there are Baptists and there are non-Baptists. You also probably know that the non-Baptists are numerically much, much stronger. And if you didn't know it before, you know now that that's been historically the case, as well as in the contemporary uh, situation. That's one thing about institutions. They're visible. And though if you don't understand much theology that underlies them, you do know very well that if you're in a Roman Catholic or a Presbyterian church, your infants are going to be baptized. And if you're in a Baptist church, they are not going to be baptized. Everybody knows that who knows nothing about the whys and the wherefores. Why do these churches baptize? Why are these churches opposed to the baptism? That's what I'm calling your attention to. These two pillars are the identity of circumcision and baptism. Circumcision and baptism are essentially the same. And consequently, circumcision was applied to children. Baptism ought to be also. I think, again, just considering the terms of debate, if that stands, what in the world are the Baptists doing denying infant baptism? That can't be true. And infant baptism be unjustified. You know full well that the Baptists are against baptizing children, they've got somehow or other to prove that that is not so. On the surface of it, it certainly looks that way. These texts have been cited and so on. And then the other pillar, not quite so obvious, but actually even more important. The Old Testament church and New Testament church are the same. They're the same body of believers. They're not a different group. One of them has Jehovah as the wife and the other is the bride. I mean, the, the, one is the wife of Jehovah, the other is the bride of Christ. One's an earthly people and the other is a spiritual people. One is a group of people righteous in God's eyes by keeping the law. The other is a group of people righteous in God's eyes by trusting in Jesus Christ. No, 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 that's a deep, deep error. But we're maintaining here, on the other hand, if they are essentially the same, and these, these group of people in the Old Testament, mostly Jews, are the same kind of people as these in the New Testament, mostly Gentiles. There were some Gentiles in the Old Testament church, and there are some Jews in the New Testament church. Predominantly, this was Jewish. Predominantly, this is Gentile. But essentially, it's the same Christ in whom Abraham and David and Rebekah and Sarah, as well as all the saints of the New Testament, are changing. Then, of course, you see the bearing of this on that is you're not talking about two different entities so that the Baptists could say, yes, that was very, very true, but this obtained an entirely different kind of church, and this right applies to a different group of people, and how someone might be able to say, even though they are identical, they don't have the same meaning because they are applied to two different groups of people. This could mean something with reference to one kind of people, and this, which performs a similar role, could mean something different to a different kind of people. Now, as I say, we'll look at that more closely when the arguments come up. My only purpose right now in this lecture is to get you, I'm the moderator of the debate, as it were, I'm getting you to understand what these two adversaries have to do what this advocate of infant baptism is contending and why, and what this opponent of infant baptism must do if he's going to justify his refraining from baptizing the children of the Christian church. I hope you all understand that so that when we do begin uh, to look more closely at this in the next lecture, we will follow very carefully the validity of the argument, 
the way in which it is spelled out, and the validity of the attack on it, whether the one stands against the onslaught or whether the onslaught is so successful that there is no justification for baptizing infants. And those of you who in infancy were baptized can't undo it. You have it, but at the same time, you will recognize that you should not have had it and that you have never been baptized and must be baptized on the basis of your profession of faith or whether the Baptists will recognize that they were deprived of a divine privilege and duty in their infancy. And while they can't go back to their infancy, they will at least recognize that their baptism rested on a foundation somewhat different than mere believer's baptism. We'll take it up, as I say, in earnest in lecture number 88.